Let's pray together. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever heard that old expression, uh, kiss, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid? (laughs) My dad used to say that to me a lot when I was younger. He'd say, keep it simple. I think he left off the stupid part, um, unless I was doing something that was stupid. But he usually said it when I was trying to overcomplicate something, when I was dealing with a problem, maybe homework or with someone, you know, at school, and and I was trying to overcomplicate the situation. We sure like to complicate things. Amen? Amen. How many times per day or per week do you find yourself dealing with situations that you just think to yourself, you know, this, this is way too complicated. I wish it was more simple than this. I'm pretty convinced that most of the problems that we deal with in our society and most of the issues that we deal with as individuals could be solved if we would just uh, make things more simple, if we would simplify things. It seems like our natural inclination as human beings is to overcomplicate things. Maybe that's just always how it's been, right? So it's fitting then that we should go back to the beginning and remember where our relationship with God starts this morning. We read from Genesis chapter 3 and This is the chapter that's popularly known as the fall or the first sin. This is the story about um, Adam and Eve in the garden with the serpent. And if we started the story here, it would be pretty easy for us to convince ourselves that we've always just been sinful and complicated creatures. The Christian church historically has certainly focused enough energy on Genesis chapter 3 and Because of that, some of us may have forgotten that that's not where the story starts. If we keep it simple, Genesis 1, where the story starts, is a much different reality. After God created the heavens and the earth and the creatures of the land and the sea, in Genesis 1 it says that God decided to make humans and that they were made in the image of God. And after he does that, he calls humans very good. Genesis 2, which then kind of creates this this closer-up view of creating humans, shows us God uh, pulling up man from the dust and breathing the spirit of life into him. And it says that it isn't good that man should be alone, so God makes man a partner. God's instructions for these two human beings in Genesis 2 are simple, tend to the land, Take care of the creatures, be good stewards of my creation, and it's not good to be alone, so love each other. And also, don't eat from that one tree. (laughs) Both of them were naked, and they weren't ashamed of that. They were able to be authentically who they were. It's not until Genesis chapter 3 that humans complicate things. Man and woman are tempted to eat of the tree that they're not supposed to eat from, and they complicate things by giving in to temptation, by being disobedient, and by thinking that what they had wasn't enough. They realized then that they were naked, and now they needed clothes, so they made clothes for one another. With this one act, man and woman took what was made simple and very good by God, and they complicated it. So today is the first Sunday of Lent. Lent is a season where we can look at all of the ways that we have complicated things in our own life. I'm sure that you can think of just a few examples of ways you've done that in your life, complicated things. Lent is also a season, though, where we can strive towards uh, to resist temptation, try to be more obedient, and also to pursue simplicity. The reading from the Gospel of Matthew this morning talks about Jesus being tempted in the desert. He fasted for 40 days and nights, and this this came right after Jesus was baptized and right before Jesus started his, his public ministry. It was a time of preparation for Jesus before he called his disciples and began the journey that would ultimately lead him to the cross. Through this time of preparation and temptation, Jesus didn't complicate things. 
things. He stuck to what he knew. He was, uh, he was uh, willing to resist the temptation. He, he was uh, striving to, to be obedient, and he kept it simple, which for Jesus meant that he was going to worship the Lord, his God, and only serve him. So what would it look like for us to simplify our lives until our goal was the same, to worship our God and to serve only him? This time Jesus spent in the desert gives us context for the season of Lent that we'll journey together for the next 40 days as we um, prepare to celebrate Easter as a congregation. And this season has traditionally been used by Christians throughout history to um, to fast and to pray, like Jesus did in the desert, and to reflect on their faith, to evaluate their lives, listen to God, and practice being more like Jesus. So during Lent, we're going to do just that. And if you were here on Ash Wednesday, you heard me say that we're also going to have um, some weekly challenges each week of Lent that are going to include um, some fasting and some prayer. Fasting from something that complicates our lives and praying and contemplating what it would look like to simplify those things. So one of the consequences of complicating our lives often is clutter. And when Adam and Eve complicated things in the garden, they also became the first hoarders. <laughs> I don't know if you picked up on that. Um, but Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together and they made loincloths for themselves. One of the consequences of their actions was now they needed to have material possessions in the form of clothing. I think when we complicate things in our lives, it usually is when we keep adding more and more stuff. Simplicity is being okay with, with what's enough, and the opposite of that is, is clutter. How often are we sold this lie that, that we need more money, that we need more stuff, we need more clothes, more cars, more storage, more stuff? Then you'll truly be happy or figure out the key to life, more stuff. There's a reason that things like a, a minimalist movement of, of not having many possessions or the, the Marie Kondo thing of decluttering and cleaning, cleaning up your space have become so popular. In our society of clutter, we've become so materialistic that it's hard to know what's truly important anymore. But what if we could become decluttered disciples? What if during Lent we could fast from materialism and pray and contemplate simplicity? So there's some biblical precedents for this in Matthew chapter 10. When, when Jesus sends his disciples out into all these villages, he tells them to go and not to take too much stuff. Right? One translation actually says, go and, and don't even bring an extra shirt. So Jesus knew that by sending his disciples with, with little to no possessions, that they could move faster and lighter, that they'd be able to go to more places, but, but also that they'd have to trust God more, that they'd have to rely on help um, from their neighbors, from the other people that they were trying to reach. They knew that you know, if they brought stuff, that could be a distraction, that clutter would, would get in the way. Other Christians throughout history have found this verse uh, valuable to adapt it into their own lifestyle. There's um, monks, orders of monks who have lived lifestyles that have been considered ascetic, which means not having very many um, earthly possessions, living a very simple life. And by doing this, they prioritize their, um, their faith life. They prioritize loving God, worshiping God, and serving God and serving others. And by doing this, they believe that their, their physical life impacted their spiritual life. So I want you to remember that this season of Lent is, is not necessarily about giving up stuff or depriving ourselves from things just for the sake of doing it. Um, but rather, it's about a season of preparation and evaluation. And sometimes in order to prepare for something new, you have to clean out something that's old. You have to, um, to make some room for that new thing. I mean, when, when you are gardening, right, there's uh, a plant can't grow unless you prune it. So you have to clear the, weed, the weeds and you have to, to clip back old um, growth. And even sometimes things that would appear healthy on the plant, you have to cut back as well so that these plants can grow and flourish. 
A great example of how that's happening right now in our congregation is with the Durham Community Preschool, right? We're, we're preparing to enter a new season of ministry and relationship with this preschool, uh, the families and the children. And so as, as part of that, we've had to um, prepare the building, um, go down into the basement and get it ready um, to do this. And part of that has meant taking care of some of the clutter that was down there, um, evaluating what was important, and then getting rid of the rest so we could make room. So how might we become decluttered disciples together? How can we fast from materialism and contemplate and pray about simplicity in our own lives? So this week, our challenge is to start with your closet. Go through your closet this week and, and take out the clothes that you no longer wear. Take out the clothes that, you, um, that are no longer serving you. Take out all the stuff that's just taking up room. By doing this, <clears throat> We can start to remove some of the physical clutter in our lives. And if we can start doing something small, uh, like getting rid of some clothing, then maybe we can do it with other things too. Maybe, maybe the thoughts in our head will shift to, well, you know, I think I can let go of this also. Or, um, you know, I, I, can, I can remove this thing from my life that's causing clutter. And, and while you do this, reflect on the way that Clothing for Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 became this symbol of how they had complicated things. Begin to pray about the things in your life that are taking up time and space that aren't giving you life, that are not contributing to um, your faith, that are taking away from your ability to love God and to love your neighbors. And now, um, you know, after you have gone through your closet and you've gone through some of this physical clutter. We're going to follow in the footsteps of uh, John Wesley, the founder of our Methodist movement, who said that, that fasting was always best combined with giving to those who were in need. So, like I mentioned in the announcements, the Brogdon clothing closet is in need of clothes of all sizes. And so, if you bring those clothes that you um, collect from your closets here, we'll sort those and we'll take them over to Brogdon so that they might serve um, somebody in our community who's in need of clothing. And if, if they can't use it, we'll find another organization um, that distributes clothing. And I want to mention, maybe, maybe you don't have a ton of extra clothes. Maybe your closet's um, already been pared down. Uh, maybe this is something you, you do on a regular basis. But, but perhaps you can find one item uh, that would be symbolic that you could bring um, as an offering for um, somebody else in need. So maybe it's maybe it's a pair of dress shoes, um, you know, that somebody else could wear. <clears throat> so our closets are just one of the ways that we complicate our lives. It's one of the ways that we add clutter. But we really do this in a lot of ways. We um, we have spiritual clutter and emotional, mental clutter that um, makes us forget. It makes us forget that, that the story starts in Genesis 1 and not Genesis 3. It makes us forget that we have enough, that we were made in the image of God, and that he called us very good, and that we, in fact, are enough. That we were made by God. It makes us forget that God's desire is for us to live in a loving and peaceful relationship with creation and with others and with him. If we keep it simple, God's desire is to be in communion with us. Even when Adam and Eve complicated things and messed things up in the garden, even when they had sinned and uh, had to leave the garden, God, God walked in the garden with them. If you keep reading in Genesis chapter 3, God goes to them and calls out to them in the garden, and God makes clothing for them when they were naked and afraid. In this very simple gesture, God established the way that he wanted to be in relationship with us, even when we don't get it right. He will still come to us and make it right. God came to us in Jesus and established a new covenant so that we could continue to be in communion with God. And God continues to come to us through the Holy Spirit and through the sacrament of Holy Communion. When we eat and drink these simple things, bread and grape juice. We remember that everything that we have complicated is forgotten. 
God's grace and mercy are available to all of us. When we come to the table, we remember what God was willing to do through Jesus Christ. To walk with us, to call out to us, to meet us where we are, and to make sure that nothing would separate us from the love of God. And to live in communion with us. And as much as we would like to complicate those things, it really is that simple. Amen.